Uh, how you been, man? I'm doing very well, my brother. <laughs> I'm keeping very well. <laughs> so for the people out there, obviously, I call you Bees, but what's your what's your full name? Because I, I, I want to dig a little bit deeper into that. So give us your yeah, full, yeah. Your, your proper name. <laughs> All right. My full name is Jean-Bernard Maurice Dioge, and um, it's a Mauritian name. Right. So, uh, yeah. So that's where I was born. I was born in Mauritius, came to Sydney, Australia when I was two. And since then, I've been a Sydney cider Aussie for most of my life, but that's where yeah. I came from. Wow. Yeah. So you speak French. You're bilingual no. or? <laughs> oh, well, like in Mauritius, they encourage you to speak French, uh, but right. there's a Creole. Like, there's, sorry, it's a broken French or a language, a separate language called Creole. Yeah. And it's actually a, it's a dialect of French, but okay. that's used in many different parts of the world. And right, so right. my parents weren't really fond of me um, <laughs> speaking Creole because when right. me and my sister used to speak it, I'd sound like a street kid, like a vagabond. <laughs> and my parents were like, <laughs> that's how I learned. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I but can't understand your... uh, someone. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, yeah, I definitely imagine you would. In your household, did mom and dad encourage your Mauritius culture like were you involved yeah. in, in like in any of that like tell us about it like that experience oh 100 um well yeah we were big on Mauritian culture um my grandfather was a Mauritian uh like a music called Sega and he yeah. was an artist in, in right. Mauritius and he released an album in Sydney uh years back my mom's a singer like we come from a musical family my sister released an album you know and so there was a lot of there was a lot of music and a lot of a lot of my culture was celebrated through the music. And so, yeah, yeah we spoke Creole food, like, you know, Creole food. Mm, um, wow. Yeah, so that was a massive music. celebration of who I was. Yeah, and music, yeah. Yeah. So how have you found those blessings of, of that culture? How have you found that that has benefited you in your chaplaincy roles? Obviously, you have two roles. You have one in school and one in uh, police. But how has that cultural... Um, element helped you in both roles? I would say just that family culture and, and, and I right. guess the way that I was brought up, it was this just this uh, abundance of acceptance and this unconditional right. acceptance from the get-go. Like right. in Mauritian culture, it's like, you know, we don't have any dramas. We're just going to love you. We're just, hey, you're, like, we'll find anything in common with you so you yeah. can be part of our family. So it's like, wow. oh, we eat the same thing great you're 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 just like just you're just as creole as i am and it's just <laughs> we find any common denominator to create community and i okay. definitely realized that when it came to chaplaincy find found yeah. anything that i had in common with someone and yeah. just was like hey we're not that much different and it, yeah it's a way like you know the whole topic of you know building bridges instead of walls it was, yeah yeah that's something that i definitely took from my culture this is yeah. family acceptance culture yeah and that and that's not normal to most people i would say like not many people have that sort of upbringing where they say hey what's a common denominator come be a part of my community and which is which is really really unique have you found that sometimes it keeps people at bay going why does this guy like me too much like what he, he why is he like have you found that with with the relationships you have in chaplaincy like people like hey you're a bit too much you want me to be a part of you but i'm i'm good stay there like What's your approach yeah. to that? Well, that's the, the first thing about, for me is that's a challenge within itself because, okay. you know, part of me, even though I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm, a, I'm an outgoing person, I would say I'm an extrovert, right? Yeah. But putting myself out there, oh, that's hard, man. That, the whole, like, <laughs> the insecurities, the fear of rejection, that's all there. But I yeah. think if my role or if my desire is to go and build relationships and connect with people, I've got to get past that and I've got to put myself out there. So finding that common denominator creates yeah. those bridges, you know, and sometimes yeah. when, when there's apprehension, you know, you, you continue to have that conversation with someone um, to hopefully break, break it down a bit more, you know, and make it yeah, more yeah. of a conversation and like easy going rather than like a formal, yeah. formal thing. Yeah. That's an interesting point because you're you're basically saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you just keep chipping away until the awkwardness goes away. Like you just like keep digging for um, bridges or digging for information. It's like, all right, this is awkward. This is a tough exterior of a person. And I, and I reckon at the same time, for example, if I was a student in school and this chaplain's chatting to me, I'm like, why does this chaplain care about the weather? I don't know where this chaplain's going. And then bam, you just 
see an opportunity. Are you one of those types of people or your personalities where as soon as you see a, a common denominator, like you said, you latch onto it and then you milk it for all it's worth and that's how you eventually build that relationship with the person or? 100%. I'm not going to lie. Yes. <laughs> like, I, I am. I am part. I have now, like, at MacArthur Adventist College, where I'm, I'm one of the, well, I'm a high school chaplain in a team of yep. three. I have now become part of the senior volleyball boys coaching staff, and I'm right. the, I'm the team chaplain. Why? Yeah. Because, like, once again, in the culture, like, there are probably three sports in Mauritius that um, it's not that we excel at, as as the Olympics would go, but it's more <laughs> that, we like that we enjoy playing right. Sport, right. volleyball and and basketball. And oh, wow. volleyball, like I used to, when we were kids, we would play with our uncles and stuff like that. And that was another thing that brought community. So finding volleyball as a common denominator at that school, I completely immersed myself into that environment. And it was just there that I could just build relationships. And yeah, I, I feel that I'm really connected with those the senior boys there. And like they, they, I guess they appreciate that relationship and it's, and it's two way. And I got to thank volleyball for that, like as that catalyst. Yeah, some people would shy away from fully immersing themselves in something. Like, for example, like for your approaches, hey, volleyball, I'm going to immerse myself into it, you know. What would you say to people, or well, for chaplains as well, going, hey, if you're a bit hesitant on something, like if it's not your thing, do you still fully immerse yourself or do you try and find something else? Like what's your approach with that? Obviously trying to connect with people, they're into something. Do you try and go, well, let me try and get into it or do you find another entry point? Well, that's it's a good thing you mentioned. And that, that's being, I guess, versatile and having variety. And it's not so much if you, you have the inability to fully immerse, that's completely understandable because sometimes there's some things that you might not be into and you're like, nah. But at least, yeah, finding other ways to connect with people, but also just getting a high level understanding of what they of what they're into, just so you can ask them about it afterwards. Like I've found in just chaplaincy, like not just chaplaincy, but in my experience of life alone, there is so much of an appreciation where people remember two things. One yeah. is your their name, <laughs> and yes. the second thing is an in, an interest or something that you as a stranger spoke about before. Because wow. for me, in my mind, it says I valued that interaction so much so that it remembered me. Uh, it, it, I, I was reminded of it. It hit, had an impact with me. That means there is some value in this interaction and ultimately the, in, the value that I have and I see in you. And yeah. even though that's such a small thing, I remember when I was um, a speaker out at uh, Berman University in Canada, there was a girl and she was in a, this thing called Acroneers, which is like high school acrobatics, you know, the whole All bring right, it on. Right. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I was blown away because their senior, their coach yeah. was a fourth year Theo student. And I thought that was amazing, right? Because that was his field. That was his harvest, right? right? And I met this girl on day one at a training session. And then on Friday, afterwards, on day on day two, I said, um, oh, hey, um, and what her, her name, because I was preaching at her school uh, during her class and I, I mentioned her name and just the way that she was taken aback the fact that I remembered her name and that's what she remembered on the Friday the, the day before I left I wow. flew out. she goes thank you for remembering my name and I was like a bit of me was like did did my sermons mean nothing to you <laughs> yeah yeah I preached my little heart out for Jesus and nothing happened no, but like, I think that just the value of me remembering her name superseded all of that. And I thought, and I'm still friends with her. And we like, you know, we, we chat with like through the school and stuff like that. But um, finding those little things that would just build yeah. the relationship, irrespective, right. yeah, you don't have to immerse yourself, but it's just yeah. being able to have a conversation. So yeah. they are reminded that they're mattered or they matter. Yeah. 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 What's your, what's your tip for remembering someone's name? Oh, practice makes permanent and be be humble. Be okay. humble. Don't pretend. So, Don't be one yeah. of those, hey, you. <laughs> Man, youngsters, anyone sees right through that. You know, we're living right. a life of authenticity. So, yeah. like, there are so many times that I'll see a youngster. No, not a youngster. This yeah. is what's happening. I'll tell you a story. Okay. I was at, um, I was originally at MacArthur in my first year of placement as in, yeah. in, in, as a, uh, in my internship. And this was back in 2013. Yeah. And these kids I saw, some of these students, 
I saw were in year three. They're now in year 12. Cut seven wow. years. I haven't seen them, right? And so in my head, they're still in year three or maybe in year four. That I saw them in year 12 and they said, hey, I remember you. You were a pastor with, you know, at the time so with so, uh, Pastor, yeah. Lang, uh, pastor Landry or Pastor Afmasang, uh, Andre Afmasang. Yeah. They, um, and they're like, do you remember me? In my head, I was like, I'll, I'll, no, I'll say out loud. I was like, I knew you when you were this li little. I remember your face. I've just forgotten your name. And they're like, my name is such and such. And then they'll tell me their name. And then I will be intentional the very next day to right. find them and say good morning to them and use their name. So it helps me, like, you know, create that neurological pathway so I can remember yeah. it and hardwire yeah. it into my brain. But also validate, hey, I was intentional about remembering your name. Yeah. It's not one of those things where it's like, oh, hey. Oh, by the way, because I remember... A few years ago, and this was when I was in first started coming to church, and uh, there was a musician at the time in in our circles, and uh, he would put, play big camps and summer camps and stuff. I was like, oh wow! And there was one time he came to our youth group, and I introduced myself to him. He's like, oh hi, I'm you know introducing myself, and I was like, oh cool. And I, and then I think another big camp, I went up to him to say hi, and he reintroduced himself to me. <laughs> and that kind of hurt. I was like, man, I thought you knew me. I thought we were, I thought we were people. I thought we got along. I thought like yeah. we chatted for an hour. After. You don't remember? <laughs> yeah. And so when I, and so that experience kind of, it was, it was a good um, lesson for me. And I said, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't appreciate someone else kind of having that feeling. So I was like, whether, whether or not, like, you know, I see you every day or not, but I'm going to try and make sure that you are recognized as, you know, someone that I'll, yeah. I'll remember your yeah, name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're saying a key there's repetition, right? What do you say to people sometimes? Mm -hmm. Some people are like, I'm just bad with names. Do you think that's a choice or do you think maybe it's a part of it that they actually just don't remember anything? Like, what do you say to that? <laughs> I would say um, just be be mindful of the impact on making that decision. If you've wow. chosen to, make, to say you're bad with names, that yeah. is going to impact students. And that's yeah. me being honest. Because yeah. I've seen, and, and this is not warning, this is not a warning or a challenge. No, not at all. As a point of advice, there is a world of difference when you do something as simple as to go out of your way to remember someone's name. Yes. And you will see, as soon as you remember someone's name, you can joke, you can say hello, and you can chat about the weather. If you're constantly having to reintroduce yourself to someone, they're not going to build trust. They're not going to build relationship. They're not going to mm. be trust. And, and this is as a chaplain who yeah. like, as all chaplains would say, sometimes we're down on resources, especially when you're wanting to get student involvement. There's more of a willingness for a student to say yes. If you ask them by their name, it's like, Hey, <laughs> really? you reckon you want to help me out? And they'll be like, sweet. Instead of, Hey, what's your name? Can you help me out? They'd be like, you don't even know me. And now you're wanting something from me. Who are you? So for yeah. me, if you're not good with names, I would highly recommend there is power in knowing and making the effort in knowing someone's name. Yeah, building trust and and having that existing relationship yeah. goes a long way. How long have you been a chaplain for at a, at the uh, or at a high school? Because I know you've been a chaplain at a few high schools, but how long yeah. has been uh, your chaplaincy stint in schools? Uh, chaplaincy stint, I'd probably say four years. Yeah. yeah, yeah, four years. And so, in that four years, what's been something that I guess you've learned that has really hit home with you in terms of chaplaincy? Well, this, it's, it's funny because uh, the two years that I, I guess, wasn't in chaplaincy, like the, the, in the last two years, I've been working out at a community center. And I don't say I was a pastor at a church yeah, because it was uh, Redfern Adventist Community Center. Okay. And I would say the role that I was doing then yes. was more chaplaincy than pastoral ministry. Right, right. And the way that I just I, I, I make the change and this might be wrong, but this is where I've kind of come to kind of make my peace with it. As a chaplain, you're at the front lines of ministry on their home turf. And so you're yeah. immersing yourself into their world. You're out of your comfort zone and you're yeah. bringing the gospel and being the hands and feet of Jesus Christ in their environment. Right. For me, the reason why I, I, I have the difference or I can share the difference is because I've worked in pastoral ministry as well. And I can say, if I've already got the reputation of being the pastor, then people will come and seek me out wanting spiritual advice, guidance, you know, pastoral ministry, because they know me to be the pastor. Um, 
as a chaplain, you've got to introduce yourself and be a, be a person in that space. Right. Yes. They might not know you as a pastor or a spiritual leader. So it's you making yourself available to them in their world so that you um the fruits or you as a reflection of Jesus Christ will draw them to you to develop that relationship for themselves. And yeah. by the way, and one of the biggest lessons that I learned was when I actually worked as the training and development manager for the chaplaincy operations team for Salvation Army. Um, yes. Tell us about that. That was amazing because what I appreciate about what I appreciated about working there um, is that the salvos took chaplaincy and they blew it up. They had right. for us in my head, I was like, oh, well, we have school chaplaincies. Uh, sorry, school chaplains, uh, hospital chaplains, um, you know, one one prison chaplain yeah. and, and, army, and potential army chaplains and stuff like that. In Salvation Army, they had 16 streams of chaplaincy. And so there was clubs. 16. And yeah. And these are like right. um, there was like uh, what's it called? Clubs and hotel resort chaplains. There was oh. rural fire and emergency services chaplains. Yes. Yes. There was, and one of the ones that really not shocked me, but I was like, this is interesting. Oh, there was RSL chaplains. Yeah. But there was also airport chaplains. And oh. uh, yeah, the team leader, like I was I still keep in contact with them. And there was a late team leader for the um, Salvation Army Airport Chaplaincy. Yeah. Uh, team, a lady by Margaret O'Neill. And one one time I called her up because I needed to um, present training and development for her and her team. And I was meant to meet up for, with her for breakfast at the airport right uh, smith international and so i said margaret let's meet up and she goes look we'll have to push back to lunch and i said you have no worries push back to lunch i get out to lunch we meet at the food court in the in, <laughs> in, in the airport and i said hey margaret why, what's the go why why do we have to meet and she goes there was a suicide at the airport this morning and wow. we are uh, as a chaplain's team we are part of the first responders we wow. are part of the emergency um the emergency crisis team Team. So you've got yeah. your ambulance, you've got your uh, you've got your ambulance, you've got your police, and you have your chaplaincy team, and mm. they are there to provide su um, support to family members, uh, any community members who witnessed it, to provide that initial support there, and then yes. engage with mental health professionals and counselors um, for further like trauma support right. afterwards. But they and what and I really love their slogan because their slogan or their their, their motto was. We loiter with intent. And so <laughs> we're in your world, we're in your environment. Yes. We're just going to be and do life with you. But the intention is to spread the gospel. And wow. the intention is to reflect Jesus Christ in yeah. your space. And yeah. I thought that was really inspiring. And that's I've taken that. <laughs> I've stolen that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I I love it. Why why for you chaplaincy? Like why why have you decided high school chaplaincy and now police chaplaincy? I am the product of a person who found Jesus Christ late in, oh my gosh, I don't know why I'm getting emotional. I am, I am the product okay. of a person that found Jesus Christ in my early twenties. Yes. Right. And I, and I constantly saw myself as an outsider coming right. in. And yes. for me, experiencing that transition into a, a family of faith, yes, I wanted to make sure that everyone that I um, came in contact with had the same experience. And the funny, and, and the thing is, I appreciate doing ministry at the schools because I know that a lot of them don't have faith, don't have a, a relationship with Jesus Christ, don't have that opportunity and invitation to experience the love and salvation found in Jesus Christ. So um, the way that me and God, I guess, have teed up my life in ministry was this. Yeah. Bees, you were out here. You didn't know me. You found me. You came in here. Now, what you want to do is build yourself up, build yourself a team, get your people, then go back out there. And so, right. for me, when I see chaplaincy, it's there. It's in the it, it's in the space of the world where people are going through life, and <laughs> people are going through struggles, and uh, unbeknownst or un, unknown, don't know the amazing miraculous uh experience of jesus christ because they haven't been introduced to it yeah. and for me as a chaplain in that space that's that's a that's a that's on an honor or a privilege that i that that it's so important for me to so, be out so there. Good. 
so yeah. so good and obviously like to segue into that mm. to go back out to go back out is like joining police force because it's not a christian police force yeah it's sorry, the let me, use, let me just yeah. pop you right there sorry ray ray it's prison chaplaincy prison now, chaplaincy it's a different there's there's difference like because i had to go through the police and through ah, right. to be right. able to go to prison chaplain through prison chaplaincy that's so, even better <laughs> I will tell you what, man, I've, I've just started, like I've just recently started and I'm going through my um, orientation and I'm doing, I'm starting to do visitations and I will tell you it is one, that's a, that's a, that it's an honor to be, right. I'm so grateful to have that invitation. I didn't know, like, I didn't know what yeah. prison cha chaplaincy was. And so but what I, this is what it is. I, I don't just go with families and stuff and visit and, and, when it's visitation times, I just make myself available. It's yeah. actually, I had to go through a process where it was um, through corrective services. Yeah. They, they have a union of chaplains and they recruit and then they have uh, churches um, have an offering or offer to endorse particular chaplains to go into the prison system. And that's where um, I can go into, and I'm not saying visit when everyone else is visiting. It's like going into the prison system, going to the, and visiting inmates in their world, like in, yeah. in prison itself. And um, yeah, I've been going to Long Bay over the last couple of weeks and it's been such a, it's a humbling experience. Um, it's a powerful, it, it's, it's really powerful for me um, because I have that opportunity to talk to people who, uh, on the verge of having no hope, you know, and if, right. if the world paints you with the particular brush, it's hard for you not to see yourself that way. And I'm still yeah. really starting to see where God is saying, no, people here, especially people here need love as well and need, need grace and salvation and, and mercy and compassion and, um, and hope. And for me, like that's, that's been a real eye opener for me as well. What does hope look like in places like that? Like, how does that? How do you paint that picture for, for men, um, behind bars? What hope is? How do you make it tangible for them? Hope. Well, for any man that I've, I've spoken to, um, any of the many of the inmates that I've spoken to, hope is the release date, or hope is parole. Wow. You know, and um, and hope is the opportunity to see family again. Um, I, I'm learning. I'm, I'm learning uh, that, you know, it's not just doing time, but along with it comes like, I'll give you a situation. There's, there's a gentleman who's doing time in the maximum security. And once he's done this portion amount of time, then this remaining time, he can either do, uh, what's it called? Parole, um, outside or inside in the minimum security part of the prison. Right. And he does programs like programs, like, you know, uh, uh, anger, Ang uh, anger, anger management, management. Yeah. yeah, yeah, those kind of programs. The, in this particular situation, he's done his time. He's ready to do parole. The challenge is he, because of COVID, um, the the people who are usually running the program and the way the facilities are managed, it can't happen. And part of his sentence is he needs to complete the program. Right. And so he's in a place where he's wanting to get out. He's done his time and he it's the control of him getting the program done is out of his hands. Mm. And so he that kind of hope that is getting stripped away from him. Wow. Um, it's that's the challenge where ultimately at the end of the day, even when the law of the land has said this is the crime, this is your punishment. He acknowledges yes. that he does his time and now he's he's finished it. Yeah. And he has the opportunity to be released back into civilization with with parole. It's like no, that's been stripped away as well, and we 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 don't know how long you need to stay in here for. And there's unfortunately there's a lot of men um, in that in that similar circumstance. What we do then um, is just be a, a place of or, or or an essence or environment of support in that time comfort yep. during that time if they need a vent they vent if it's a platform where they can just express their emotions without the fear of you know this going somewhere or this being on their record and stuff we can provide that oh well to an extent like if it's in regards to self-harm or that kind of stuff um you know um 
compulsory reporting is is done but you know when people are like i just where, right. where they feel that the energy of wanting to persevere and having that re resilience is stripped away from them that's where like the chaplains have the opportunity to provide that to pro provide that hope to provide that reassurance that even in the midst of their loneliness even in the midst of their abandonment you know jesus is still there you know the um, lord is still there and god is still there with them yeah. you know yes. and it's always it's always a, a, an amazing experience where you can celebrate grace to the people who don't feel that they deserve it. Wow. And grace out Jesus Christ when people don't deserve it. And I'm a product of that. Bro, you want to talk about prodigal son? I am the prodigal son. So yeah. the reason why I'm in chaplaincy is to say, if I'm, you know, I, I say this when I preach all the time. It's like Paul Paul calls himself the chief of the, sin, the, chief of the sinners, right? I look yeah. to Paul and I say, brother, that's cute. I'm the king. I, I <laughs> wow. so so many things in my in my life that I'm not proud of, and that that I yeah. would call sin beyond sin, right? Yeah. But God has changed me by the power of Jesus Christ and and His transforming power. I am saved by grace, mm. and that is something that I've been called to celebrate, even mm. in the tough circumstances. And and for me, when when I go to the prison and and brothers are asking to pray, that I don't take that lightly. It's, yeah, it's not just a, 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 a nice prayer, just say, hey, I'll just bless you and that's it. Like you're 100%. praying to, to to really change a life. You know what it's I mean? It's praying to give an essence of hope, man. Like yeah. if this guy is saying all I've got left is my faith and I'm yeah. going to say, well, God is sufficient for you. Like, you know, God is enough. During this time, God will be enough. And I need to pray that into your life to remind you of that. Yeah. That's how it is. Like I feel that's what the weight of it is. And you you, you feel it with, with the great the gratitude of those brothers mm -hmm. when, when they leave. It's it's sure the circumstances haven't changed, but I, I guess that that opportunity in that environment to remind them that God is present there, yeah, really I would say goes a long way. How do you refill after a big day of school and of prison? Like we in our line of work, we give so much, not because it's our job we have to give, but it's just because it's our heart, it's our passion. As you said, it's that connection with God and going that we feel this is a calling to, to instill or give or offer hope. Yeah. But how do you play? Like, how does bees refuel? Like, what do you do to sort of top yourself back up again, ready to go back out? Now, this is um. now I'm going to be real talk with you now. Right? Yeah. For me, it's taken me a, like I would say the uh, the length of my professional career in in my 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 working career to know that even in ministry, no, in 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 paid employment and outside of paid employment, God has still called me to minister. God has still right. called me to be the hands and feet, regardless. Right? Yeah. I'm leading. I'm being obedient to His leading in the direction of my life where I think He's leading me, because I'm like I'm putting it out there. I'm saying, God, you want me here? And he's like, Yeah, let's do this for a bit. And so for me, but irrespective, the overarching reminder that God gives me is that he's saying, I've called you to go and spread the gospel, period. Yeah. So for me, going into school chaplaincy, going into minis uh, like prison ministry, when, when it comes to, I guess, my life, and this is not just chaplaincy now, I guess it supersedes the idea of chaplaincy, but it also works concurrently with um, the idea of chaplaincy. My end goal, or what I hope my end goal, my vision, is yeah. is not uh, you know I want to be this or I want to do that. At the end, it's it's a passage found I think in Luke nineteen, where God just says, "Well done, good." And... I don't know what's going on. Sorry, right? That's all right, man. Well, the key is God saying, "Well done, good and faithful servant." What I gave you, yeah. you were you you were faithful. You used in, it. Man. Come, yeah. come and come and relax. And so, for me, when God says that, or when I have tough days, when I have good days. Yeah. That's what fills me up. That's what drives me. And and for yeah. me, like, I'm, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that I did things like, did courses, right? Like professional yeah. supervision. Um, I did, I've just recently completed a course in acknowledge, um, sorry, acceptance, commitment therapy, suicide prevention, and all these things. And I really feel like, I don't know if you, yeah, you probably remember him, Dr. Murray House, right? Yeah. Dr. Murray House. You have a, his, that brother, man, you either love him or hate him, man. I love him. He's one of the- I love him. I love him. I love him. He taught me so much at college. And one of the key things he said to me was, he goes, don't think that you're going into ministry to go and change millions of lives. 
Right. I want you to think about it this way. God might just keep be keeping you in ministry just to keep you saved. And for me, that was like, okay, it humbled me. Yeah. But God put me on this journey, getting getting me educated and saying, I need you to be safe. I need you to keep well-being. I need you to be healthy. I need you to, your mind to be right. Because the work that you're doing for me, in me, through me, yes. is going to be ministry. And so for yeah. me, how do I keep my, myself sane? Bruh. <laughs> well, there's that health, the health struggle, you know, I'm always struggling with. <laughs> like even music, all music. This today. Is music your outlet? Like, you know, you're still doing music listening to music dancing like what like what yeah surely no nah. well i'll tell you why last year <laughs> yeah i had such a shocker of a year yeah like i felt that um like i was on the brink i'm not gonna lie i was on the brink of burnout yeah. right it got yeah. so tough yeah. because i felt that the hours that i was putting in and, and and the work that i was doing it was just taking out taking out and i just felt yeah. i was feeling drained and the problem was Satan, man, it, it, it'll, it'll capitalize on that. Yeah. And so any area of my life that I tried to get a sense of rejuvenation and yeah. um, and recharge, he 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 hammered down on. It yeah. was like, like it was tough because I was part of a community center and it was needing a lot of resources, right? And so to the point where my wife had to come and support me in my ministry. And like, you know, like in ministry, it's like, keep your ministry away from, uh, separate from your family. And so it seemed like I was utilizing and capitalizing on the generosity of my wife that Satan was like, that's what I'm going to do to your marriage. And like, wow. he was hitting me on every corner to the point where I refused to listen to worship music because worship wow. music was what brought me into church. Right? right. That was the thing. I went to Parramatta Ooh. Church, so Aiden Kanji, Eric, the brothers playing. And so I, I did like I committed to not wor worshiping. And I was listening and I would listen wow. to the song, but I wouldn't let it impact me because I basically boycotted God in his way of wanting to minister to me. Wow. And so for that year, I, it was, I, I was on lockdown. <laughs> like I was straight up, I was just going through the motions yeah. to the point where I, and the funny thing, I was invited to go to um, the conference, Converge, and yes. for praise and worship. Yes. And I was like, okay. And I went as a musician. Yeah. Right. I didn't go as like a worshiper. I went as a musician. So I'm like, I'm come, I'm gonna play the drums and do my thing. Yes. And funny enough, it was at it was I think the first night I yeah. was playing the drum. They dimmed the lights, and this was this is during lockdown. This is after like a, a time of lockdown where we're able to worship together. So we got like 300 right. strong in this big tent and it just remin we're just reminiscing about the times that we we could worship together. AV team dims the lights and we start singing the um, uh, tour. My brother tour um, starts singing the song promises by Maverick city. Yes. And all of a sudden I'm playing and I allow myself to hear the song and I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit, <laughs> in that moment, I start playing and I don't hear the lyrics of the song. I hear Jesus Christ's voice saying, I know what you went through last year, man, and you're, yeah. it's okay. You did good. It's all right. You got through it. And it was like he was <sighs> affirming me in that. And I just broke down, man. And I like, it's like I was like, I get you, I get what you would, I get what you mean. And I, it's like I reopened my heart back to worship. Now, oh, man. Like praise and worship, I love it, and I'm, I'm into yeah. it again. Yeah. Because of COVID, unfortunately, we're not able to jam together. But yeah. in, the, in the moments that I could this year, absolutely love it. Absolutely love uh, it. I would say definitely for me, um, what recharges the batteries um, is just spending downtime. Like this might sound silly, but just doing silly time wasting things. Yeah. Um, like I love I love doing that because it helps me kind of empty myself of like the drama and the stuff that's happening in my head. I yeah. do my devotions and I, I give it all back to God. And that's yeah. when he goes, like, hey, day one, let's do another day. Let's do another day. And it's like right. my, my, my reliance on God is helping me live day by day. Um, you know, even though I, I've got plans and I've got a future and all that kind of stuff, he's saying, I'm giving you enough. I'm giving you enough. And, uh, and my faith is um, making me confident that I can rely on him each and every day. Yeah. Man, that's such a beautiful story, bro. And thank you for your vulnerability. And oh, oh, like you were saying, I don't know what's happening, right, bro? I do. You're sharing your story. Um, and that's what we need to hear more of. Like when we share our story from a place of sincerity and not to boast, it's actually to say, hey, I'm, 
I'm broken. I don't have it together. I have these leadership roles, but I'm broken. I'm I'm just as I'm just as the same as the person who I'm trying to help as well. Um, yeah. Bees, yeah. Yeah. my man, thank you again so much for your time this um, well, this well, evening. Well. It is evening, and uh, I look forward to when we get to catch up again. But yeah. until yeah. then, when can, uh, where can people find you, bro? Okay, so um, I do I do COVID devotions at nine o'clock in the morning and five o'clock okay. um, every day during this lockdown. Okay. And so if you look up, oh, if you look up um, Jean Bernard Maurice, if you look up bees online yeah. or if you look up put bees to work hashtag put bees to work or covid devotion you'll find one of my ones there and just look look me up on instagram same thing i'm i think it's bizush b double e z double s h and if you want to see a bit of a light hearted side of, side of me look uh look up bizush on uh tiktok <laughs> and i've got a couple of funny ones up there as well <laughs> but yeah uh hey ray ray thank you so much for your time brother i really appreciate it